so when uh, when the paper was when this paper was written and when it was published, I was at Stanford and Joe Gagnon was uh, a, a PhD student, uh, but I can't remember exactly when he was a PhD student there. But uh, certainly when I was when I was there. Um, so he might possibly have heard this in a seminar. The uh, background for this is is that it's really I, I started thinking about these issues in my PhD thesis at Berkeley, and it was in a in an empirical context, which was the um which was that I was I had data on the wholesale price index by sector uh, and I um I guess it was one of one of the faculty there um uh, Richard Sush says that suggested that I look at the cross-sectional variance of inflation. So I started looking at that. I, you know, I measured it in, uh, in a natural way and uh, noticed that there was a lot of time variation in the cross-sectional variance of inflation. And I, I, I eventually came up with some, I, I noticed a pattern, which was that there was higher variance of inflation, cross-sectional variance of inflation when it, um, when the output growth rate was um, large, positively or, or negatively, relative to the potential output. And there seemed to be a particularly strong relationship at high levels of output change. So I, I did a kind of simple econometric model and found empirical support for that. Uh, using data through 1975. And of course, this was a period where there was a lot of... Uh, there was there was a lot of inflation, particularly towards the end of this uh, uh, of, of the data period, and uh, of course that continued for some time afterwards. So, so I wrote up the paper after uh, finishing the thesis and sent it to the Journal of Political Economy, and they rejected it. So, I can't remember why. I used to, I used to have letters of my my most uh, interesting rejections. Uh, <laughs> I hope I still have them somewhere in a file. They're they're all very interesting. Um, so I decided to develop the theoretical model underlying it further. Um, this is after the thesis uh, and uh, changed its its focus to be a theoretical paper, and I submitted it to the Economic Journal. So I, I thought that was that was a pretty good call. They 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 love the paper, um, and but I I stopped doing the empirical work. I gave some thought to it, and I thought, well, you know, I've got other things to do. So I never actually wrote up the empirical works uh, separately, and I essentially abandoned the paper that I'd submitted to the JPE. Because and just decided to focus on the theoretical stuff. So maybe that was a bad call. You know, if I had to do it again, I'd probably have done some quick changes for the empirical part and sent that out. Uh, but I was working on other things. And so those other things worked out well. And the conclusion I came to was, uh, it's just a matter of time. You've got to choose at every stage. What, what, what are you going to work on? What are you not going to work on? There, there are too many good things to work on, and you actually have to sort of pick one and go with it. So, um, but I, I have I have wondered periodically over the years: Is anyone ever going to notice this paper? <laughs> and it turns out you need a period of high inflation for anybody to pay attention. <laughs> so, uh, so thanks for finding it. <laughs> so, how you know what was uh, going on in the background at, at this period is that. Uh, there was kind of a battle in, within macro between the classical and Keynesian side. And the and it had to do with price flexibility. And the classical models, or the new classical models of, of Lucas uh, and, and people following, um, 
had, had wages and prices that jumped instantaneously to market clearing levels. So there was a friction of some sort for Lucas. It was an information friction. But basically, prices were at um, market clearing levels. And then you had the other tradition, which uh, is at the time uh, most prominently uh, Tobin, and then some newer papers by Berwin Grossman and Mallenbow. And their idea was that at any moment in time, prices and wages were sticky. They didn't move flexibly to clear the market. Uh, but then you have to deal with the fact that if prices aren't at market clearing levels, what level are you going to trade? And they said, well, you're going to trade at the short side of the market. If demand exceeds supply, then the suppliers aren't going to be willing to supply more. Uh, and if demand is uh, smaller than supply, then uh, buyers aren't going to be willing to buy more. And so that's, that the quantities are traded at the by the short side of the market. And that's a that's a kind of a you can see the the theoretical appeal of that. And it's got some price stickiness into it. And then the idea is that the sticky prices will evolve over time in the right direction. Although, as uh, I guess it was Axel Lanhoff had uh, emphasized and as Clower emphasized, uh, that you have to build into your demand curves and supply curves the fact that quantities aren't trading at the market clearing levels, but they're determined by the short side of the market. And so you have you had the the language was um, you look at effective demand which builds in those constraints as opposed to notional demands that are just determined by, by prices and incomes. So um, trouble with, with that, I, you know, I, I, looking at the world, I thought I saw a lot of sticky prices. So, and, uh, and it seemed also clear that you weren't at uh, the uh, frictionless full employment classical equilibrium. So, um, so I was tempted by the sticky price approach, but there are a couple of problems with the Berwin Grossman Mallenbow approach. By the way, Berwin Grossman eventually they had a prominent paper, and then they wrote a book on it. Mallen, it was a very hot topic. Mallenbow wrote a book, uh, and then it just kind of that 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 approach to things just stopped. Um, and it's basically. For two reasons, I think one is that it was difficult to explain how you ever got a positive output gap uh, because of this short side constraint, and the other was that uh, it rapidly became extremely complicated, which is why books were written on this. Because if you had a disaggregated model, every single market could either be in a short side or a uh, it could be at a on a demand constraint or a supply constraint, and there were all these regimes, and it just became intractable. And it just it just it just didn't look clean. So it looked implausible and complicated. So so the so in the in this in this economic journal paper, the introduction you know it was interesting rereading a paper that I'd written thirty five years ago and trying to remember what I was thinking at the time. And that was that was stressed in the introduction was it look. You know, you know, neither of those approaches seem to work well. There's got to be somewhere that splits the difference in a way that 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 meshes with economic reality. So, so the idea is that prices are sticky uh, until um, in, until they until demand is high enough, and if demand is high enough. So that demand exceeds the supply at the sticky prices, then those prices uh, rise to clear the markets. So it's sticky only in one direction in any given market. And the point at which it becomes non-sticky is when supply is completely inelastic and the only way to clear the market is for prices to increase. So that's 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 kind of the background. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the the model then, and 
Um, I seem to be able, I think I can, um, you know, I'm able to fit it on to a relatively small number of slides. Uh, and, and then there, we can look at the model in the short run and the medium run and the long run. And the bottleneck phenomena, the one that's probably most interesting, is kind of a medium run dynamic. So you have to see the whole model and think about how it works in the longer run, but then it's in the medium run that the action is. So we need a, I needed a model that's focusing on the aggregate supply side. So what you do is you simplify the aggregate demand side as much as possible. And the easy way to simplify the demand side is use quantity theory of money as it was known then, which is that you know, MV equals PQ, take logs, you get that the real money, you get that the money stock, the log of the money stock is the price level plus a log of aggregate output, and there's a velocity shock. So that's the way people talked about it then. It was just this, I mean, it, lots of people use this. Uh, Lucas used it in his, in his paper. Uh, the way that we think about it now, as Mike Woodford suggested at some point, uh, here's a good way to think about it. Just think of what, what is P plus Q? Remember, these are logs. So this is log of the price level plus log of the quantity, log of GDP. Uh, so that's the log of nominal income. And um, Wood, Woodford's point is you can say, well, what's happening here is the monetary policy authorities target nominal income. They just fix nominal income up to a white noise shock VT. And they do whatever it takes to get there. So uh, that's the that's the modern way of of, of presenting this uh, very simple aggregate demand equation, which is that nominal income PT plus QT. I'm not going to keep saying everything's in logs. Everything is in logs going forward. It is just determined by the money stock up to some white noise shock. So the so the uh, aggregate demand side is simple. Think of it as nominal income targeting by the central bank. Okay, so we've got sectors. We're going to have capital N sectors. And we'll think of them in a symmetric way so that aggregate output, again in logs, is uh, the average of the aggregate outputs in each of the sectors at any given moment in time. And the same thing with the price level. So implicitly behind this is a simplifying assumption that uh, all goods have uh, unit price elasticities and have unit uh, income elasticities. So that's the that's a simplifying assumption there that there's a there, and you could get that if you had Cobb Douglas utility in the background. And th this this can be generalized, but this was done to. Other things seem complicated, so this was the simplification to keep the uh, model as, as as simple as possible. So it's it's going to be a model that has stochastic shocks in it. Uh, another disadvantage of the Barrow Grossman Malinvo approach was that uh, getting those in really complicated things, whereas in this model it's pretty simple. So the demand for good of type I is just determined by the aggregate demand, that's the income elasticity, and then depends negatively on the relative price. Then we have an exogenous demand shock for each sector, which uh, was modeled as a random walk. So all the U's here are white noise shocks and uh, and the demand shocks move over time. So I'm setting up in a, in a stochastic way so that we can actually look at what would be a the stochastic process of aggregate output uh, when it's in its when in, when the economy settled down to a stationary in the statistical sense equilibrium. Uh, but as I said, I've got a the, there's going to be a focus on the short run uh, where every, where all those exogenous shocks are, are fixed and you just vary policy uh, as well as a long run and then a medium run dynamics. So the shocks to each sector are exogenous white noise that is uh, nearly independent across uh, sectors uh, because of the adding up constraint. They can't be literally independent, 
Uh, but that would go away if we had a continuum of of, of uh, sectors. Uh, but um, but that that makes things harder in other ways. So we'll just go with that. Okay. So then firms. Remember, I'm trying to keep everything as possible simple. So firms here just have one input, which is labor, and it's specific to that sector, and they produce under constant returns of scale. And so it's basically one unit of, of um, labor produces a fixed amount of output, or put differently, KI is the unit labor requirement to produce um, the good in that sector. And so output, again, everything's in logs, output is... Uh, simply the amount of labor minus the labor requirement, unit labor requirement. So now we're going to assume that firms produce in a world of perfect competition. So there's the higher labor at a, a, at a given wage. So the wage is going to be XIT. So they hire labor at log wage XIT. And in a perfectly competitive market, price is going to equal to um, marginal cost. And that's just going to be the unit labor requirement uh, times the wage. So price PIT equals XIT plus KI. Um, one, of, one of the advantages of the Barrow Grossman Mellon Bow approach was that uh, I guess it was actually Jean Pascal Benassi, I think, who who said, "Look, we can do this with a monopolistic competition." And uh, he he pointed out that um, it, it's actually very tractable if you had a monopolistic competition rather than perfect competition in every sector. You just wound up with a markup that you had to add in. So uh, so there's there's nothing that says that in, in this model. Everything could be redone, assuming that it was that in each sector there was monopolistic competition, so that there was a downward sloping uh, demand curve. You could still have bottlenecks. So the, the 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 key here is that is the assumption that prices uh, are perfectly flexible. So in in this model, it's only wages that are going to be inflexible downward prices of goods are flexible up and down so that's what gets us out of the complexities of, of barrow and grossman so we'll talk about wages in a second so anyway uh, firms just set prices as a as a markup over over wage costs i'm sorry with a zero markup over wage costs So now we get to the labor market, and this is where the bottlenecks come in. So every, every worker is in a particular sector I. So we've got these N, capital N sectors. And in any given sector, uh, there's a, 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 a supply of labor in that sector. And that's fixed inelastically at LIT. So at time T, there are LI people in that sector. Workers are distributed across the sectors. In the long run, they're allowed to move, but and we'll and I'll model how they move. But in the short run, they're there. And there's here's the rigidity. The rigidity is a downward rigidity on wages. So there's some sort of base wage, which has log WIT which acts as a floor to wages. And of course the motivation here is that uh, that seems to be quite common in the, in the world. Uh, many people have noticed that uh, workers are particularly resistant to cuts in wages. Uh, that, you know, quite apart from other kinds of imperfections in the market, there seems to be a floor to wages. So, um, in the in the spirit of keeping things as simple as possible, there is a 
a Florida wage in each sector called the base wage. And otherwise, wages move flexibility to clear the market. And so what that means is that we've got a simple complementary slackness condition, uh, which is that uh, they're, they're just uh, they're just two states. Uh, one of them, uh, and one of them, wages is uh, in, in the amount of employment in the sector. NIT is less than the supply, and in that case, wages are at the base wage. That's an excess supply state of the in the labor market in sector I. Uh, and the other is that you're fully employed, the workers in that particular sector, so that actual employment, NIT, is equal to the labor supply, LIT. Uh, and for that to be a mark, and then in that case, we have to we will have market clearing with the actual wage, XIT, over here, XIT, uh, at or equal to the, to the base wage. So if demand is high enough, the wages clear, uh, arise to clear the market. So there's a very simple, whoop, I guess it's there. Uh, there's, the, there's the relevant figure put it slightly in the wrong place. Uh, so the, uh, so there's the base wage, WI, and sector I, here's the actual wage. And if the demand for labor, and it's, is in that particular sector, which is derived from the demand for output in that particular sector, is uh, very low, then supply is bigger than the demand for labor, uh, but wages don't fall to their market clearing levels. They're, they're, they're at the floor and there's unemployment in that sector, that amount. But if demand rises, eventually you hit the market clearing level. And then if demand in that for labor in that sector is sufficiently high, uh, then at the base wage, there would be, well, in the Malenvo, um, Barrow Grossman sort of approach, it'd be sticky and there would be this excess demand and it would be determined by the short side of the market. And the wage would temporarily stay at WI. It might move gradually over time. But then you have all these different regimes, which I was worried about. No, let's just have the way the, the wage rise to clear the market. So that's our that's our bottleneck effect, is that there's a point at which the supply of a factor becomes completely inelastic uh, and price rises to clear the market in that sector. So everything here is is the, the bottlenecks are all in labor markets. Now that again, that's something that one could could generalize. You can, uh, particularly in the context of recent events, where we have a lot of supply chain bottlenecks, the, the, the essence of the bottleneck approach is that there's some uh, component in your production process, which is in, a, in an inelastic supply, which is critical for the production of the good. So I've always thought that... Uh, this kind of approach could be generalized. You needed some sort of uh, input-output matrix to superimpose on all this, uh, which is something that uh, people kind of gave up on these input-output matrices that uh, used to be popular in the 1950s. They weren't even popular in the 1970s. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I think we're kind of rediscovering the importance of inelasticities in the production process over the short run. So uh, anyway, that's an aside. Anyway, so that's I guess we'll we may come back we'll come back to this diagram in a bit. But uh, that's the that's that's the 
That's the essence of this. Okay, so there's so that's the that's this, that's a nice algebraic way of of summarizing this. Okay, so now um, in the longer run, there are a lot of there there are going to be a lot of adjustments of prices and labor movements. So let me just sketch out what those are. So these will feature into the longer run dynamics within the model. So with these with these kinds of rigidities that are in the labor markets, you need to think about ways in which they're going to be overcome over time. Uh, and that's going to involve two things. One is that these base wages ought to change over time in response to uh, supply and demand. And uh, there probably should be movements of say, labor between different sectors in response to differing wage possibilities in different markets. So the adjustment of base wages should follow a type of Phillips curve. And so that's the, that's the way I modeled it, which is that the change in wages in sector I over time should respond to the uh, appropriately defined demand for labor in that particular sector. So I just need a definition of what's the excess demand for labor at the base wage. So it's the base wage that's rigid, rigid here in the short run. So you want a you want a measure of the excess demand for labor at that base wage, and you can get that in the diagram just by looking at uh, at the wage what is the what is the difference between uh, supply and demand. So we just look along the base wage here, and if if the demand for labor is low okay so then you've got unemployment so that's the that's uh negative excess demand for that type of labor on the other hand if you're in a in a bottleneck the actual wage is higher but uh we'll have it responding to the the simplest way to model it is that you look at the excess demand at the base wage so if 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 the demand for labor at the base wage exceeds the supply, which is inelastic, uh, then base wages should increase over time, whereas they should fall relatively anyway over time if there's uh, unemployment. So the algebra is is simple and relatively clean. That that's the that is the uh, relevant relevant excess demand. Uh, for labor of type I at time T. And then we'd assume that the base wage changes over time with some coefficient psi uh, in response to that. And then this is, this is the augmented Phillips curve portion. So it also makes sense since these are nominal wages that there should be a response to inflationary expectations, or I called it inflationary momentum at the time, because people were naming it different things depending on their point of view, and momentum had a certain uh, way of uh, not taking sides on exactly how expectations are formed and feed in. And uh, so, so ZT here is inflationary momentum, and I'll give you an equation for that in a minute. Uh, but that's that's going to basic. At least I think I do. Don't remember doing that. Yeah, it's coming up, uh, and that's just going to be a way of incorporating recent inflationary ex, uh, experience. So this is really the this is just the Phillips curve part, and it operates uh, just on base wages. And then it's a stochastic model, so there's going to be aggregate shocks and and sector specific shocks uh, to the to the base wage. Okay, so that I think is just copied, right? That's a change in the base wage. So this is the same as this. 
so the the inflationary momentum term was modeled in a, a really simple way that was common at the time still pretty common uh zt is is beta so beta is the is the Uh, beta is is the uh, extent to which uh, the change in actual wages in the preceding period uh, filters through into ZT, and then there's uh, a component. So this is just like an adaptive expectations with a coefficient of of beta, where beta is the weight on the most recent observations of uh, actual wage inflation why didn't you have prices there instead of wages as part of the inflation momentum uh, it could have I uh, could have done it either way and I don't think it I don't think it um, matters hugely uh, at the time again I'm, I'm just you know thinking of the uh, of the literature around then, there, John Taylor had a had a paper that was right. prominent, and he was emphasizing that workers care a lot about relative wages. Right, right. And, and here I've got workers who were who were um, uh, looking at other sectors and thinking, should I go there or should I stay? You know, in the next equation. And so I, I'm basically taking that piece, but I think. Okay. Uh, but I think you could do it either way. I don't think that's crucial. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's possibly it possibly the algebra worked out better too. So I, I was I'm, I was quite I'm, I've always been quite flexible in choosing my assumptions in any particular model to make the algebra <laughs> cleanly. <laughs> and I can't after thirty five years remember exactly. <laughs> okay. what, but but I do know that uh, John Taylor, who was uh, who was actually in the department about the same time as I was, so uh I, I may have been influenced by that yeah okay so either way uh so the, anyway there's there's one dynamic here which is which is inflation expectations or inflation momentum uh, and the other is that labor should flow from sectors that are low wage sectors to high wage sectors okay this may be a relatively slow process or it could be you know, I don't have any view on that. Uh, but then I have to think, okay, so what are they going to respond to when they're when they're moving from one sector to another? And uh, my thought, again, this was partly just to keep the algebra simple, was that the flow from one sector to another ought to depend on the shadow relative wage, was the term I gave it, which is. Uh, the difference between the sector's market clearing wage and the average market clearing wage. So that turned out to be a neat way to model it. And that leads to the equation here. If, if theta IT is the so L is average employment. All this, all these sectors are symmetric. So um, they're the same size, I guess is the way to think of it. So theta IT is the excess of, is the extent to which the amount of labor in a particular sector differs from the average. And theta should adjust depending on the average market clearing wage so if we go back to our that figure the market clearing wage for a given existing supply uh, is just associated with demand here's a low demand sector the shadow wage the shadow base wage is the, well, i guess the shadow wage is where the where where markets would clear the wage at which they would clear uh, up here that's where they do clear if you're in a bottleneck state the, the the shadow wage is the actual wage but if you've if you've if you've got unemployment it's the wage to which would clear the market so i, I the reason i thought that was 
an attractive assumption was uh, there's this, there were these papers in the development literature by Harrison Todaro, and they were talking about, well, lab, you know, labor moves uh, to sectors where uh, wages are high and unemployment is low from sectors where unemployment is high or wages is low. And the shadow wage just captures both of that. You know, suppose so if you're if you're in this situation, unemployment is low and the wages are high. And if if you're in a bottleneck, if you're in a in a in a situation where you're at the base wage, you could think of that as well. It's a mixture of of uh, wages being lower than in the bottleneck sectors, and also there's this unemployment. And how do you roll that into one figure? We'll just think of the terms of the shadow wage. So that captures both the fact that there's going to be some unemployment in that sector uh, and wages are lower than they would be in the bottleneck. And you just capture it through one shadow wage. So, so as you can see, I just you know, pick the assumptions that make the model work in the cleanest way. Uh, so, so that's the that's the assumption is that with a parameter lambda, workers are going to move from uh one one sector to the other and then as always there's going to be a, a a random white noise shock uh since um random stuff happens okay so now uh we've got now we can look at the model so those are all the equations of the model and now we can look at the model and we can look at it in different time frames and in the short run, we can pin down what the equilibrium is given the exogenous and predetermined variables. Then we can look at the long run where we're settling down into a, a stationary stochastic process with a given distribution of bottlenecks and a long run equilibrium supply curve. There'll be a mean natural rate of unemployment. So we can get uh, Friedman's idea of the natural rate of unemployment popping out of it as a long run property. Uh, and then there's some particular dynamics that are connected to the bottleneck that I called medium run dynamics in the paper. I don't know if that's the best term, but anyway, it's a it's a um, it's a it's a feature of inflation that arises when the level of output changes, aggregate level of output. So we start off with a short run equilibrium. So there are a whole bunch of predetermined variables. There are there's there's the level of demand controlled by the monetary authorities. There's a shock at the an aggregate shock to demand. There are the uh, all all the different uh, you know the weight base wages in each sector. There are sector specific demand shocks and so on. There's a the production. There there are never any productivity shocks. It's always that that could be generalized too, but uh, kept things that. The algebra would have become a little messier to build those in. So there's always just a unit labor requirement that's fixed in any given sector. So anyway, if you if you take all n sectors and you take all the predetermined variables, I'm sorry, uh, uh, all the predetermined variables, then you can solve for the endogenous variables, which are the prices, the actual wage x, which is at or uh, above the base wage, the production in that sector, QIT, and the employment in that sector. And then you can aggregate all that up and you get the aggregate price level, the aggregate uh, wage, aggregate, by aggregate, I mean average, um, you can think of it as aggregate, uh, and the uh, aggregate output level, aggregate employment. So the next step is if in the short run, We've, we've got a lot of predetermined variables, and you can construct an aggregate supply curve uh, that's generated by those predetermined variables. The idea is that in any particular sector, you can figure out where that point is, where the bottleneck appears, and it depends on, on the demand in that sector. The, that's associated with that particular sector, it depends on the on the 
relative base wage, the wage in sec the base wage in sector I compared to the average, it depends on the on the relative labor supply in that sector. Do you have relatively more in that sector or less? Remember, everything's I mean, because of the unit elasticities, that's all we have to look at is uh, we don't need any coefficients there. And so if you if you look at this particular measure, Ri, that tells you when the bottleneck is going to materialize. And you can order these from uh, R1 is the one where I think you enter the bottleneck first. So if you imagine ma moving aggregate demand, you're going to hit the bottleneck first in one sector and then in another sector and then in another sector. And as you increase demand, you just add sectors that, exp that are in the bottleneck state. So we, we have this distribution of bottlenecks, which in the short run is fixed, with R1 being the first bottleneck you hit and Rn, capital N, being the last bottleneck you hit. If you, if you move demand high enough, every state is a bottleneck state and you're in a... Uh, 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 flexible price world. And so here's the here's the picture that goes along with this, the figure that goes along with this, which is that if demand is low enough, then you're the no sector is in bottleneck, there's excess supply of labor in every single uh, sector. And the price, the price level is just a markup over those costs and it's rigid. But then you hit a sector where you have the first bottleneck, and as 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 demand goes up, so I'm I'm also drawing a, you know the the aggregate demand curve is just a straight line, right? P plus Q is some constant M plus V, and then we can imagine policy moving that around. Um, so I can tell it as if I'm increasing aggregate demand as I move the aggregate demand curve out here. Uh, then, uh, then I hit another sector that hits a bottleneck, and another sector, and another sector, and another sector, and the aggregate demand curve is getting steeper each time you hit a bottleneck, until the point where all the sectors are in bottlenecks, and if aggregate demand expands, there's no increase in output, aggregate output, and prices uh, just go up to clear the markets. And one of the nice features of this is you can, of course, consider different bottleneck distributions and, and think about uh, what, what their effect is. And so I think there's some, there's some simple, some simple um, theoretical results that, that emerge from this. So let's just look at what the slide says. So we've got all these, these predetermined variables. You can compute the, the short run equilibrium values for any for the predetermined variables we can order the bottlenecks and from that ordering we can construct an aggregate supply curve which depends on the average base wage the average unit but unit labor requirement and then this this function which depends upon uh the distribution of bottlenecks and it's going to be a as drawn, it's going to be a increasing and convex aggregate supply curve, although it starts off horizontal and eventually becomes vertical. But in between, it's a it's a convex supply curve. And then the aggregate demand curve, as as drawn, is just uh, given by m plus v minus w minus l. <clears throat> well, that's actually <clears throat> uh, this is this is the uh, I guess this is aggregate demand and the demand curve reflects that. Okay, so uh, here are some, <clears throat> sorry, here's, here's some short run comparative statics results. And it fits with what I just said, but adds a little. So at, at, any, <clears throat> at any short run equilibrium where aggregate demand crosses aggregate supply, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, there's going to be a proportion of the of the economy that's in a bottleneck state. Call it B. So it depends on the distribution of bottlenecks R, and it depends on the level of demand. 
and it's and the proportional bottlenecks is obviously a non-decreasing function of aggregate demand, which we can parameterize by just varying m. As we increase m, we push the demand curve uh, up and to the right or down and to the left, if you hold R fixed. And if we do that, we can see what the effect is on, on prices and on output. And the higher the, so the, the proportion of bottlenecks B lies between zero and one. And if the proportion of bottlenecks is small, then an increase in aggregate demand through monetary policy uh, is, is relatively small effects on prices and big effects on output. And so the split between the effect of an increase in monetary policy on prices versus output just depends on the proportion of bottlenecks. And that also implies that uh, as you change as you change the um, as uh, the, the the slope of the aggregate supply curve, dpdq is going to be the ratio between b and one minus b. So if if uh, ten percent of your so if if half of your if half of your sectors are in bottleneck, then it's going to be a fifty fifty split. But as you have a higher proportion of, of the uh, sectors in the bottleneck state, uh, then more and more of that's going to be a uh, price effect rather than a quantity effect. And then there's another simple um, formal result, which is uh, imagine that the spread of the, of, of the uh, bottlenecks uh, increased. So just take, so these bottlenecks Ri, those are negative or positive. That's deviation from average. Suppose that spread increased by a factor mu, then that's just going to shift the aggregate supply curve up to the left. So if there's an increasing, if there's a larger dispersion of bottlenecks, then that convexity um, is reflected in the aggregate supply curve. And you can see that in the long run, that would lead to a, a, a higher average level of unemployment in the stationary equilibrium. So at least I'm going to claim that later, and that's fairly intuitive. And then the other nice thing about this is that, of course, B equals zero, that's basically the, case, the classical case, and B equals one is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, B equals zero is the, I think I've got these switched. Uh, if there are no bottlenecks, that's the Keynesian case. And if every every sector is in bottleneck, that's a classical case in which money is completely neutral. Okay, so uh, we can think about the long run now. In the long run, let's just have the money growth at constant rate G. This is Friedman's dream. And the economy is hit by these stochastic shocks. I had stochastic shocks at lots of different points here. And you can show that it'll eventually converge to, in the long run, to a stationary stochastic process. And in fact, as I've set it up with white noise shocks and normal distributions for the shocks, the distribution of bottlenecks actually converges to a normal distribution with a suitable variance, sigma squared r. And so there's a corresponding uh, long run equilibrium aggregate supply curve that takes the form P equals W plus K plus some function. And that function can be written out explicitly in terms of, of the normal distribution. And so in the, in the long run, output converges to some stochationary process around some, some mean. And there's a corresponding so in the long run, this is again, Friedman's dream, expected inflation is G. And there's a corresponding mean unemployment rate, which U bar, uh, which because of the normal distribution assumptions, you can actually compute 
and it depends on the on the standard deviation of the distribution of bottlenecks. And so that corresponds to this last figure here. That's the that's the equilibrium bottleneck curve. And the 45 degree line there, here's, here's the uh, maximum uh, output that can be produced, given that there's fixed supplies of, of labor uh, at any in the which has a distribution, but uh, uh, because of the large, you know, as n goes to infinity, n time goes to infinity. So uh, if we have lots of, if we have a continuum of, of sectors and we wait long enough, then it'll converge to this distribution, which will have a mean as shown here. And the unemployment rate here uh, can be can be computed and it has this nice formula. So that's kind of nice. It's It's got, Good properties in the long run, and it's something you could you could uh, study further. And I did actually have one paper that went further in this direction, which I'll mention at the end, uh, which I forgot about until uh, until uh, Doug brought this possibility of doing the seminar up. Uh, okay, so so we've looked at the short run. And we've looked at the long run. And so now I want to emphasize the medium run inflation dynamics that are connected to bottlenecks, which uh, occupy a very short section of the paper at the end, but uh, at the moment seems like the most interesting part. So to focus on the novel inflation dynamics that arise from bottlenecks over the medium run um uh, not sure whether that's the right term but anyway to see it let's let's look at the let's let's ignore the random sectoral shocks and let's shut down a lot of things let's say xi is zero so that means there's no phillips curve effect on base wages i'm getting rid of those just to emphasize the bottleneck inflation aspect and let's say beta is zero, so that inflationary momentum term doesn't change at all. And let's suppose that lambda is zero. That's the sectoral labor movements. So there's none of that either. But we consider what happens if there's a change in aggregate output over some period of time, say one year. Say everything here is annual. So suppose you change monetary policy and you get a change in aggregate output. Then what's going to happen to inflation? Well, you just go back to the aggregate supply curve. And we're holding W is fixed because we've shut down the, that's the base wage, because we've shut down the Phillips curve effect on base wages. Uh, and uh, and the and the distribution of bottlenecks is is fixed because we've shut down the sectoral labor movements and any random shocks that affect those at the sectoral level, and so we just have that aggregate supply curve that has has this equation, p equals the base wage plus k plus that function that depends on the distribution of bottlenecks, uh, which is a function of of output at time t, uh, and then you just look at the change of prices to first order and we just need the derivative of f but we already have that that's b over one minus b and so that says that the change in prices is equal to the change in aggregate output induced by the monetary policy change times b over one minus b that's bottleneck inflation so if output goes down and there's no uh, trend here in output. So if you introduced a trend in this model due to, due to labor force and productivity growth, then this would be the output gap. So let me tell it that way. If there's a decrease in the output gap, then there will be a corresponding uh, change to prices. So if the output gap goes down, 
there will be a fall in prices. So there would be a negative rate of inflation that's resulting from the bottleneck contribution if there's a decrease in output. And the extent of that disinflation is going to be given by the bottleneck ratio B over 1 minus B. So this is just reflecting the fact that there's actually in this bottleneck model, there's a there's a level effect of output on prices. So that means there's a chain, there's a so that means that the change in output results in a change in prices. So there's a relationship between inflation, just you know, just purely through the bottleneck part. There's a relationship between inflation and output growth, which was the thing that I was worried about originally in my my thesis, that that there's this that you're moving up and down the the aggregate supply curve. Uh, which is completely independent of the Phillips curve effect on ba base wages, uh, and it doesn't, and and as well as inflationary momentum and independent of sectoral labor movements. So, just at a moment in time, you could slide up and down the aggregate supply curve, and that in itself changes the inflation rate. So, there's that equation again. So, uh, so. In particular, if you're starting at a high level of Q, high level of output with a larger, relatively large proportion of uh, sectors in the bottleneck, a reduction in output, say induced by contractionary monetary policy, can lead to a large reduction in inflation. And it's separate from these other effects like the Phillips curve effect, which is that a lower Q feeds through into um, lower base wages. So in the context of the current economy, uh, this could be important. It really depends on the proportion of, of, of sectors that are in, uh, in bottlenecks. And of course, it's been all in the news. You've got labor shortages in different sectors. So that's labor bottlenecks, uh, firms saying that they have difficulty hiring at their normal wages, the base wages. They have to bid up wages in order to get workers. And uh, supply chain bottlenecks, which aren't obviously, we don't have any other material inputs here in the model. There are no material inputs, intermediate products, but, but clearly the idea of a bottleneck can generalize to and ca capture that as well. And so it could very well be that a reduction in output relative to trend uh, would actually lead to a substantial reduction in inflation just through the easing of bottlenecks. And of course, people have been saying that, but that's anyway, that's that's here in the model. And if these other factors are there, what if I, you know, I shut down beta, that's the that's the uh, inflationary momentum thing. Well, I shut that down just so that we we didn't have to argue about it, but it, but suppose inflation comes down through a reduction in uh, the amount of bottlenecks because of an easing of output relative to trend. Uh, if that happens and then gets incorporated in inflation expectations, then of course that's a, that's an additional bonus of reducing bottleneck inflation. And of course, also over time, you know, if we're in a situation where there are lots of bottlenecks, it's it is of course that it's possible there will be sectoral movements in the model. It's labor movements which ease bottlenecks, and that itself will over time uh, lead to lower inflation. So I guess when we're looking at the actual world and we're thinking of bottlenecks, uh, that's part of what we would expect. You know, people keep saying, "Well, bottlenecks are going to ease," uh, and that you know, people who who like to rely on bottleneck inflation and it's a kind of argument against the Fed being too proactive. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, bottlenecks are ease just because resources are going to go to sectors where there's excess demand in the sense of a higher uh, price relative to, to marginal costs uh, but, or higher wages. Uh, and uh, that, that, that could also contribute to this. Uh, but quite apart from those effects, that, that could also contribute to a lowering of the inflation rate. But quite apart from that, uh, simply lowering the level of the output gap uh, could have large benefits, but it all hinges on what the proportion of sectors in the model 
is that in the world that is in a bottleneck state, and I have no idea what that is. So that's the that's the main. I just have a few concluding <laughs> remarks here. So um, it was actually a fairly short paper. Uh, so it was very interesting. It took me quite a while to remember how it worked uh, in detail since I haven't looked at it in decades. Um, but I have been wondering about it for the last year, whether somebody would notice it. So thanks, Doug, for bringing my attention to it. And thanks. Yeah, thanks for all you guys. But um, yeah, here's some uh, uh, other remarks. Um, the, the, what I just was describing, that's kind of the optimistic view of how of, of, of our situation. If we've got a lot of bottlenecks, then just easing the bottlenecks could be a big deal in terms of getting inflation down. Uh, but of course, uh, that doesn't say that, you know, it's still the, the momentum term, the, which we will usually think of as inflationary expectations. Uh, they may have been elevated quite a bit because of the recent high inflation. Uh, although the financial markets make it look like, you know, if you look at the bond interest rates uh, compared to indexed bonds, uh, it's elevated, but it's not it's not terribly high. It's just high, uh, but that that may be hard to get that term down. Uh, so that's that's a different topic, right? Is how expectations are formed and I, might, I have a there's um i spend a lot of time thinking about expectations so the other work that i said stopped me from pursuing the empirical part of the variance of inflation topic um was basically on expectations and the difficulty of coordinating on rational expectations and boundedly rational ways of thinking about how smart but not infinitely smarter agents are able to uh, form expectations in a sensible way and the issue of coordination of expectations. Um, I've got other current work, unpublished current work, uh, that will hopefully be published soon, uh, that focuses on how inflation expectations of boundedly rational agents are likely to respond to announcements of a temporary regime of high interest rates. And uh, the basic answer there was uh, there, there are lots of ways in which people, boundedly rational agents, uh, can learn to form expectations in a sensible way that it reflects their experience. And I think there is a, there's something to be said for the point that I guess Jim Bullard has emphasized most recently in, among the board members, which is that uh, especially if you have past experiences of successfully reducing inflation through high interest rates, through tight monetary policy, that can make it easier the second time around if people remember that it was effective before that really can that really helps the second time around for boundedly rational agents but this is it's different paper so i just wanted to offset my optimism about bottleneck inflation with uh with uh, some sympathy i think it's a difficult place for policymakers to be in right now uh some sympathy for the report the the approach of the fed saying we're going to do whatever it takes. Well, the, the Fed didn't say that, but some members did. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention, this is a follow-up paper. I, I realized I had one other paper that used this, this bottleneck framework, which is uh, a short paper. Uh, they, uh, the Conduct of Monetary Policy and the Natural Rate of Unemployment. It's in the JMCB in 1989, so a few years later. And that, uh, I just mentioned what it did in case you think it's worth looking at it it uh, generalizes the model a uh, bit in terms of it doesn't have the unit elasticity assumption everywhere through it uh, and then the other thing is what it does is it makes a policy argument which is why it was published in jmcb that the uh, because of the convex aggregate supply curve if you have a 
since there are aggregate shocks that can move you up and down the convex aggregate supply curve, if you can get a monetary policy that stabilizes output, that'll also raise the mean level of output and lower the corresponding uh, natural rate of unemployment. Basically, it's the it's the Jensen inequality with a convex curve, which is by reducing the stochastic volatility, it'll push the natural rate of unemployment lower. So I think that's uh, okay. That's that's it.